Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Kitchener Center Riding Debate on the Environment, one of the many 100 debates on the environment being held across Canada tonight. My name is Mary Jane Patterson. I work at Reap Green Solutions, an environmental charity that helps us all live sustainably. And I'll be your moderator for tonight's debate. Let's take a minute to ground ourselves in this land, our First Nations, and sustainability. We acknowledge that Kitchener Center Riding is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples. We recognize the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today, their achievements and their contributions to our community. And we value their traditional knowledge about how to live sustainably on this land that we share and will leave for our future generations. Let's keep our future generations in our minds tonight as we hold this debate on the environment. Now I'd like to welcome our candidates for tonight's debate. We invited the four parties that are part of the federal leaders debates to participate. Joining us tonight are in alphabetical order of party name and then rotating from here on Mike Morris, Green Party of Canada and B. San Zuby, New Democratic Party of Canada. Not joining us tonight is Mary Heinen Thorne from the Conservative Party of Canada. Also not participating is Raj Saini, who ended his campaign for the Liberal Party of Canada on September 4th. Raj's name will still appear on the ballots because they have already been printed, but it's too late in the campaign for another Liberal candidate to run. Bisan and Mike, welcome and thank you for participating in this debate tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about how the debate will unfold. We'll start with a one minute introductory statement from each candidate. Then we have eight questions in the first section. These have been developed with input from the 100 debates standard questions, as well as contributions from environmental organizations active in Waterloo Region, including the sponsors of this event. These eight questions have been sent to our candidates in advance and each candidate will have two minutes to respond. Then in the second part of the debate, we start with a rapid response question, just one. I only have 30 seconds to pose the question and you only have 30 seconds to respond. And then there are four audience questions that have been solicited by the Waterloo Region community. We received many questions in the weeks leading up to this debate from local community members and organizations. And we wanna say a big thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Those have not been sent to the candidates in advance and candidates, you'll have two minutes each for those. And finally, there will be two minutes for each candidate to provide concluding remarks. Now I wanna say a little bit about wild cards. This is one additional opportunity, really two additional opportunities for candidates to speak. You each have two wild card options, which you'll activate by selecting the raised hand option on the Zoom or just waving at me when I ask after each of the first questions. The wild card provides you with an opportunity to respond to points made by the other candidate or restate your own position and you have one minute for each of those. There's only two wild cards. You can choose when to use them or not to use them and they can only be used during the first round of eight preset questions. There will be no rebuttals in the fast response or audience question rounds. After each question, I'll ask about the wild cards before we move on. And now a few words about decorum and proceedings. Let's be flexible. Um, Mike or Bsan, if one of you loses your Wi-Fi connection while you're speaking, we'll carry on and then allow you to finish when you're reconnected. If I lose my Wi-Fi connection, Jana from Waterloo Region Nature is going to step in. She's standing by uh, the picture of the egret with the rushes at the bottom. Uh, we have a timer with us tonight. Shannon, thank you very much for being here. Um, when you've only got 10 seconds left, Shannon will uh, hold up a card that says so. So watch for that signal and begin to wrap up your remarks. And if I have to, I will interrupt and move us on. So, oh, and please do not speak over one another. All right. I'm very reassured by your nodding heads. Thank you both. Candidates, Mike and Bisan, are you ready? All right. You have one minute for your introductory statement 
Bisan, we'll start with you. Hi, uh, my name is Bisan Zubi. I'm the NDP candidate in Kitchener Center. Um, if you don't know me, which I think that you know quite a few of you are meeting me tonight for the first time, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I live in downtown Kitchener with my rescue dog, Luna, who's from Mexico. And if you hear or see me kind of dealing with that, that is her zoomies after doggy daycare. And I work as a social responsibility consultant with local nonprofits. So I work with local organizations, their leadership, and also teams uh, to help them become more socially responsible in their practice. I am also coming from an intersectional lens, and that is the lens that I'm going to be applying tonight, as well as in my work on Parliament Hill. An intersectional lens comes from the position that different systems of oppression work with each other in tandem to actually reinforce and normalize each other. So a big part of my focus and a big part of my framework is looking at how um, you know different sources of oppression actually work together. So I'll try and uh, uh, show that to you this evening during this, this forum. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> Thank you, Bisan. And over to you, Mike Morris. Thanks, MJ, and hi, everyone. I'm Mike Morris. Uh, I came to our community to study at Laurier almost 20 years ago, and I stayed to start a sustainable Waterloo region. In the years that followed, alongside REAP Green Solutions, we created and got approval for our community's first climate plan. Um, more recently, I joined community organizers for the newly approved uh, climate plan this past June. Dating back to the 2019 election, I've spent almost three years listening to neighbors, to those on the front lines, and local experts, focusing not on the politics of mudslinging and division, but on democracy, on actually listening to what's important to us. And the environment and the climate crisis is a top priority I've heard from neighbors over this time. Having come in second back when I ran in 2019 and you know, knocking on 45,000 doors with hundreds of friends at that time, now we know we're in a position to win, ready to put our community ahead of any political party. And I'm really excited to be, to be part of this conversation. Thanks again for hosting it. Thank you very much. All right, we're ready for our questions now. And here's the first part of the debate with eight questions. We would like to know what you, if elected member of parliament, would do to help solve these environmental challenges. We're looking for you to go beyond stating what your party has done or will do. And at least in your initial responses, we'd ask you to avoid talking about what other parties are or are not doing. You have two minutes to respond. Here's the first one. Will you develop a new incredible plan to halt and reverse nature loss, protect species at risk, and meet Canada's commitment to protect at least 30% of land, freshwater, and ocean by 2030? And Mike, we'll start with you. We must recognize that as humans, we're interdependent with all other living beings. And so for that reason, my answer is yes, because 30% is actually the bare minimum to support global biodiversity. And so for my part, I'd wanna work with other MPs to develop and follow through on this plan recognizing that we're just over 11% at this point following various promises made by other governments. We also know that protecting uh, economic and, and, um, and sorry, protecting conservation areas makes economic sense. Uh, biodiversity loss is one of the top five risks to the global economy. Economists and scientists tell us that the, the benefits of protecting ecosystems outweigh the cost five to one. And so, we need to conserve biodiversity. We need to protect ecosystem services. And I'm also glad to see that this is in the green platform as well, not only protecting, again, a minimum of 30% of fresh water and lands in each Canadian ecosystem by 2030, but also halting habitat destruction by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Bisan, over to you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for that great question. Um, we do forget about biodiversity. And we also forget about the majority of the lost biodiversity in the world is happening outside of Canada. So what we're doing has to be in solidarity with other global movements to stop climate change. 
Um, I am hearing so much excitement uh, from different people at the doors, but also different people who are approaching the NDP because of uh, the climate activists that are joining the NDP right now. So I'm also excited to be able to reach for the expertise and the, I mean, global renown of our of the caucus that I will be working with in Ottawa if I'm elected for uh, Kitchener Center's next member of parliament. So that means, um, you know, Indigenous leaders like Leah Gazan, who has um, completely like through her work on the UNDRIP as well as um, just her advocacy in Winnipeg Center um, to other activists such as uh, Avi Lewis who yesterday received the endorsement of several Greens and David Suzuki because they understood that this was um, you know that kind of important moment because the NDP has also committed to preserving 30% of that um, of that biodiverse uh, areas with that would be it freshwater be it um, you know forest green areas but we've also come to that table um, by you know bringing forward indigenous voices to actually lead that conversation and to be um, you know our spokespeople on these important issues so that's really meaningful to me because I know that that is a really important part of any work that we do on climate. Thank you, B. Sam. Thank you, Mike. Would either of you like to invoke your wild card at this time? All right, hang on to those. <laughs> Question number two, Indigenous people play a critical role in environmental solutions. Exactly. This is a bit of a two-parter and a mouthful. Just hang in there. Will you implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report? And will you invest in Indigenous-led land use planning in the establishment of Indigenous protected and conserved areas? And Bisan, it's your turn to go first. Thank you. Um, so like I was just saying, um, Indigenous led and, um, you know, really grassroots led types of initiatives are extremely important. But what we need to be realizing is that Canada as a state is a colonial state. And so when we are talking about our climate policy, our environmental policy, we need to come to that from a position of a decolonized lens. So we're actually not making decisions for or about um, Indigenous communities um, that we are doing our due diligence to actually stand up to uh, the treaty uh, you know, responsibilities that we have as a nation. And all of that kind of needs to happen in order for us to be able to have indigenous communities as an equal partner and as a um, respected partner in this process. Um, of course, bringing more indigenous voices to the table is so important. Um, in this election, I believe there's 35 indigenous candidates running across you know, the country. Uh, the NDP has 27 of them. I don't want that to be underscored. Um, this is really a moment where after what we have seen and after a collective um, consciousness has been raised, um, you know, we can all be part of uh, amplifying and respecting and stepping away and allowing uh, those voices to really, you know, take the foray. Um, we need to make sure that we are approaching these issues um, with an equity lens, making sure that we're not coming at it with our own preconceived notions. Um, and that's the way that that will kind of that relationship will grow uh, equally, and it will grow uh, with respect. Um, one more thing is that I am Palestinian. And so my consciousness of um, Indigenous settler relations is complex. And my um, identity as a settler here in Canada is also complex. That is a lifelong learning process that I'm undergoing. But I can say that I understand very well uh, the need for land, the need for um, autonomy, full rights, and um, the ability to make your own decisions and be a steward of the land, you know, that has been yours for generations. So um, there is solidarity there, but I just know that on these issues, the expertise is really, um, it's, it's really diffuse. And I really wanna be talking and sharing that expertise as well. Okay, thank you, Bifan. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, MJ. Uh, yeah, we need to recognize that marginalizing indigenous ways of knowing and being has had devastating impacts on the biosphere and on all of us. It's why I have and will continue to focus on learning from Indigenous leaders in our community 
And so to answer the question, first of all, with respect to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it should already have been done years ago. Yes, I'm glad to see it passed just a few months ago now. And I'd be keen as the MP for Kitchener Center to be part of a broad coalition of MPs moving forward on implementation, listening to and centering Indigenous voices in doing so. With respect to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to actions, again, it's been since 2016 and we've only implemented 13 of 94. And so, yes, absolutely. When we speak of centering and listening to Indigenous voices, th these calls have been made years back, past now. If we can even look back further back to the Royal C uh, Commission uh, back in 1996. And so, yes, as the MP for Kitchener Centre, I'd be continuing to advocate and, and work alongside other M MPs to move towards fulfilling and imp implementing and completing all 94 of the calls to action. As it relates to uh, in Indigenous protected and conserved areas, again, yes, and we have to recognize the importance of being Indigenous-led, ensuring that Indigenous worldviews and knowledge and governance systems are centered at every stage. And I'm also glad to see that this is also in the Green Platform as well, specifically speaking to working with Indigenous governments and organizations to develop a national framework for Indigenous protected and conserved areas. Thank you, Mike. Bisan, are you uh, invoking your wild card opportunity? All I right. Indeed. Shannon, start the one minute clock. I believe the intentions there are great, but I don't see the path to action. And that I think is something that um, indigenous communities across Canada cannot abide. Um, who would you work with to do these things in a situation where the liberals have had plenty of opportunities and they have not done anything? So would it be with them? Would it be with the NDP? Because they're a really great party who's trying to do a lot, but they do not, um, like we, we have a very kind of you know, clear ethos and you have to run as an NDP member to be able to work with the caucus in, in that way. We have, a, we have a contract between us. We're a party of, of, of like minds. So I don't see the path there. And my concern is that we have an opportunity right now where Canadians have a collective consciousness. They want to act. They want changes to happen. They don't want more conversations. More than UNDRIP, we, we can actually force our courts to become accountable for, you know, crimes, to investigate exactly what happened on residential schools, to see if the International Criminal Court should be involved. There are so many things beyond, um, you know, just conversation, which in my, you know, in what I've heard, um, Indigenous partners are tired of. They want action okay, and they want to see us moving along. All right, Bisan. Thank you. Mike, are you invoking your wild card now, your first one? Is this allowed a wild card on a wild card? Is that a thing? Yes, we are just going wild right now. Okay. Do it, Mike. Uh, well, yeah, so just to be clear, what I stated earlier, what I meant to say to clarify is I'm not speaking of just listening and doing another study and doing another TRC. What I attempted to share is that as the MP, I'd be advocating to implement the calls that Indigenous leaders led by Chief Justice Marie St. Saint Clair have already made. And the challenge as I see it is the need to be working across other MPs. In my, in my view, this is not about which party someone's with. I'll work with anyone, whether they're with the NDP or they're, they're with the Liberal Party or others. My interest would be to be a voice and an advocate for our community, to follow through, move past promises being made, and actually move towards implementation of all 94 calls to action of ending the boil uh, water advisories, of you know, following through on UN DRIP and, and actually imp, uh, implementing. And so that's what I'm trying to speak when I speak about actually following through and taking action. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. We'll move on to question number three. This summer, the discovery of 215 unmarked grades at Kamloops Residential School sparked a reckoning. Since then, more than 1,500 unmarked graves have been found on residential school grounds. How will you continue that investigation and work towards reconciliation for the atrocities committed at those places? 
And Mike, you're, it's your turn to go first. Thank you. Um, so yeah, again, we need to start with truth before reconciliation. Uh, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, there were six calls to action specific to missing children and burial information called 71 to 76. And these included calls specifically about records from chief cor coroners, funding for a student death register, responding to families' wishes for commemoration cer ceremonies and reburial in home communities. And so as we've spoken about before, would want to advocate to be listening to these calls that have been that have been made and have gone unheard, unimplemented for years now. That is a critical piece of moving towards, you know, these, these, this was known for, for some time. Uh, and then when it comes to an investigation, as I shared before, when it comes to listening to Indigenous leaders, the Honorable Murray St. St. Clair has already called for an independent investigation outside of the RCMP. And so when this question asked kind of, how would you want to go about that investigation? I would want to put forward doing so aligned with what folks like the Honorable Murray St. St. Clair have already called for. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Bifan, over to you. Thank you. Um, I mean, so unfortunately the number is not uh, 1500 it's at 6500 right now that number is going to keep rising um, and I don't think that we are paying as much attention at this point and I don't think that we are feeling the trauma in the same way as we did for the first 300. Um, what we need to do is make sure when we are talking about you know these kinds of solutions or these kinds of sorry, these kinds of problems are, we are actually centering the problem itself. And the problem itself is that our, our society keeps ignoring and keeps marginalizing and keeps pushing down these voices. So we have seen our current leadership just ignore, deflect, pass blame. And it is, we, it, it is, it's enough. We've had an, there, it's been enough. There is, no, um, there is no ability to negotiate or to change the minds of people before they see the humanity of others, before they understand the consequences of a state's actions. You must act. I understand that it is really, really nice to get along with people, but people are dying. People are suffering, and this is an acute crisis with a solution. That solution has to come not through more discussion, not through more, um, you know, talking about implementing things, but following and like supporting the people who are doing the work. Leia Gazan is who, who put forward that UNDRIP motion that we were talking about. I want to be able to support her because I know that she is going to be the future of a decolonized Canada. That is our opportunity that we have in front of us. I can't keep, I can't keep pretending that we are not in the system that we are in because every other door, well, not every other door, but whenever I meet somebody who doesn't want to vote, it's because they think that the system is broken and done and that they should just, you know, scrap it. And, and we have something that we can okay, work with if we work with it. All right, Bisan, thank you. And this is one more wildcard opportunity before we move on to the next question. Okay, question number four. All eight municipal governments in Waterloo Region have committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050, with an interim target of 50% by 2030. How will you, as a local representative, help make that happen? And Bisan, we'll start with you. I think it's a great question. Um, I, I'm so in, you know, impressed by what the municipalities are doing um, through the work of local climate organizers um, and 30 by 50 and Meg Raton Walker. So um, shout outs go to that work. Um, we are 
a, a model. And I think that that was inspirational for other municipalities. I think what the federal government's role is, is encouraging that kind of ambition and providing resources to achieve that kind of ambition. So the first thing that I'd say is I always get a little bit chilled when somebody deflects responsibility. If this is our right, it is the responsibility of all levels of government to work together on climate change. So you can't say it's provincial, federal, municipal, when we're really talking about our survival. So that cooperation across levels and making sure that there's co-op um, communication and healthy participation um, throughout levels and systems of government um, is really, really helpful. I'm so fortunate to have Laura May Lindo at the provincial level to work with, as well as so many other municipal rep um, uh, uh, representatives that I know from my own run for regional council back in 2018. Um, one thing that we would do that would accelerate the ability of the region to um, meet those goals is by assuring that retrofits of every single building in Canada will be done by 20 years. And then all other buildings, so those built after you know, this date, 2020, will be done in 30 years. So that way, by the year 2050, ca Canadian buildings will be uh, you know, more uh, ecologically friendly, they will stop wasting energy, and they will be a part of our transition to a zero carbon uh, economy. Um, so we have really great goals and we have great ambitions, but what has to happen is that different levels of government have to all come around this goal together and work together to really get them across the finish line. Okay, thank you, Bisan. And over to you, Mike. Well, let me start by saying that I'm actually just really proud of our community, of what uh, local organizers, activists, uh, community leaders, and local elected officials have done for climate action and ambitious climate plans to move from you know not having a climate plan at all in 2011 to just a few months ago passing unanimously a plan transform wr that aligns with science you know talking of a 50 percent target by 2030 and 80 by 2050 we've got a lot to be proud of there and what we heard loud and clear from local councillors and from community leaders um, is that we know we can't actually meet those goals if we don't have more from the federal and provincial governments. And so this question asked how, as our local MP, would I be part of making that happen? And so to answer that directly, I'd want to do it the same way we've done it locally. <laughs> the same way we were part of many of those conversations, many of the folks who are attendees here have been part of this work for over the last decade. What did we do? We worked collaboratively. We built trust across different levels of government, across activists and community organizers in our community. And we worked respectfully to push the envelope further than I think any of us originally expected, you know, 10 plus years ago, and now have a lot to be proud of. And that's what I would want to do at the federal level is to take what we, you know, we're leaders in this country now. Other municipalities are looking, have always, you know, Kingston's climate plan looks a lot like Waterloo Region's climate plan because they read ours and great, right? They copied and pasted a bit. And that's what we need to be doing at the federal level as well to have federal leadership that makes clear the time for talk and, 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 and all that is done. We need action on climate change that matches the science and as our MP, that's what I'd be pushing for. And hopefully there might be some more time to talk about some of the specifics of what it might look like, but there's some of the how at least. Thank you. Thank you both. Would either of you like to use your wild card, your remaining wild card at this time? Okay. Question number five. Will you commit to a green and just pandemic recovery? Please specifically state what you would do to address how women, people of color and other marginalized groups have been disproportionately affected by both the pandemic and our environmental crises. And Mike, you go first. The organizers got three questions in one here. So here's the attempt in two minutes. The first is on the just recovery. Yes, we need to focus on workers disproportionately affected. You know, if we weren't giving billions of dollars to oil and gas companies, we could be investing in the people on the front lines. I was spoke, speaking just a few days ago with a person who was a mechanic, a, a local diesel engine me, um, me, mechanic, and his anxiety is real. You know, two kids, friends at work saying, you're probably not going to have a job in five years time. He's never voted green before. 
but we had a good conversation where I feel like I actually heard where he was coming from and got a chance to share with him my interest in making sure that we provide whatever supports income protections and retraining so that that person, whether it's an EV manufacturing or otherwise, that those skills are part of the economy of the future. As it relates to uh, Black and Indigenous and racialized folks in environmental crises, we need to be supporting bills like C-230, which was at second reading before the election was called, to develop a national strategy to redress environmental racism, working with organizations like the Enrich Pro Project and leaders like Dr. Ingrid um, Waldron, uh, recognizing, that, and I'll be brief there, we can come back to it. And then the last around Black and Indigenous and racialized folks in the pandemic. Uh, recognizing that we have, you know, a neighborhood in Victoria Hills that was infected by COVID at twice the regional rate. Um, and we know that's partly a mix of overcrowded homes, language barriers, lack of trust in institutions. And again, listening to calls from local organizers, the African, Caribbean and Black, the ACB network, for example, calling for an equitable response, including full transparency of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout plan in Black communities, ongoing PPE distribution, uh, particularly for structurally disadvantaged residents, as well as more. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And Bisan, it's over to you. Um, I have been hearing these concerns all over town um, from people who either they worked throughout the pandemic or maybe they were, uh, you know, they were out of work, maybe they were on disability and um, they were even further compromised because one of the uh, wage earners in the household was also out of work, but it has been uh, felt very, very hard. And um, the intersecting systems of classism, so people who are experiencing poverty, uh, racism, people who are subject to systemic racism, um, you know, homophobia and transphobia, uh, people who are queer, trans, um, they might not have the same social supports um, as, as uh, heterosexual people might. Um, when we're talking about, you know, Indigenous people who have, um, you know, they have so many different kinds of state instituted uh, barriers to access and the furthering of, you know, just the, uh, the likelihood of uh, on reserve infections, those actually happened in the middle of an urban core. We need to be looking at all of these issues because they are interrelated and the solutions are also interrelated. We need to be looking at how we create better jobs that are sustainable, that are creating clean um, and uh, uh, sustainable infrastructure, like, ho like housing, like transit. We need to be looking at how we are focusing on women's labor and appreciating women's labor because we know that hundreds of thousands of women were removed from the job market and have still not found their way back. We know that racialized communities suffered um, from hotspots, they suffered from medical racism. Um, we know vaccine hesitancy um, has, has, has a historical reason in many communities, and yet we have not really come to terms with that. So our recovery needs to be conscious about vulnerable people, about putting vulnerable people made vulnerable by our systems of oppression first and at the foundation of everything that we do, because that's how okay. climate justice will happen. All right. Thank you, Bisan. Uh, this is a wild card opportunity before I go on to the next question. Okay, seeing none. Question number six. It has been over a decade since Canada first committed to ending fossil fuel subsidies. Will you push your party's leadership to end all government subsidies for fossil fuels? And Bisan, we'll start with you. Yes. I will. I don't see as a young person a future in a world without that that is operating on fossil fuels. I have not for a long time personally seen that. Um, I understand that um, there is still work to do in terms of building, you know, exactly the consensus on how that works. But the first step of that is bringing people to the table to the actual conversation that's happening um, that have these shifted goals. I think that we can do better. We we are polluting our planet. We are creating unsustainable jobs that will not be 
there for the next generation, but what will be there um, are just problems and more crises. So we can act now. We don't have to keep waiting. We don't have to keep wondering about what a divestment looks like. We can start that work and find out as we go. Um, and, and I really think that we have an opportunity right now. Um, right now, I believe the climate conversation is becoming more and more intersectional. So I think that the possibilities of really holding those uh, corporations that are accountable for climate change while letting people thrive and people be healthy and live healthily in nature, that is on the table again. And I'm so excited to be, you know, fighting for that, for that future. Thank you. Mike, over to you. Thanks for this question. I really hope it's one of the ones that's being asked across the country in these hundred debates on the environment, because this gets at the crux of it. When I started Sustainable Waterloo Region, you know, and after five years here and then in across the country, having hundreds of businesses reducing their emissions and taking action on climate at the same time, it became clear to me that while that work was important and the emissions, you know, tan tangible in, in the tens of thousands, it will never be enough if the economy is deeply uh, off balance in a way where we're sending, you know, last year alone, we tripled the subsidies, $18 billion to oil and oil and gas. And unless we change federal policy, all the grassroots roots work, the, the, what, we, what we spoke of earlier in terms of our community's climate action planning, we will never move to meet the science if our federal government doesn't wake up and, and do the same thing. And so in my case, you don't, you don't need to push the party leadership. Of course, they're already there, but more importantly, our community is there too. So many people across our community, when you look for common ground, we all can agree. And so often the case from speaking with folks at their doors, this is not a time in the midst of a climate crisis to be subsidizing fossil fuel. And that instead, imagine what we could do what could that 18 billion do in terms of whether it's incentives for electric vehicles or cycling infrastructure or retrofitting buildings across the country, all of, of, the, of the work that we know needs to be done and to be incentivized so that a homeowner can make that choice that they know it's actually a more, uh, a, a more cost-effective choice for them, whether it's around insulation or retrofits and all the rest. And so that's the conversation I wanna keep having is how do we take that 18 billion and put it towards the climate future that we actually need? Thank you, Mike. Wildcard opportunity, Bisan, you're using your remaining wildcard. Go yeah. ahead. Um, thank you for that. I just wanted to bring up just the point of the saying that our economy is off balance. Our economy is functioning exactly as those who are in power and in control want it to function. Um, I feel like there's no power analysis in the conversation that you're having, Mike, because I don't feel like everybody comes to the table as a willing participant in these kinds of discussions. So I don't see, um, you know, the liberal party who does protect the interests of the corporate elites time and time again, negotiating with anybody, let alone one person, um, on changing and, and uh, you know, forgetting about those interests, because those have been powering them this whole time. I think we need to have a realistic understanding of what it'll take to actually get system change. It's not going to come from a system that's somewhat off balance and the government just needs to wake up. We need to wake them up and we need to all collectively in solidarity do it together. Okay, thank you, Bifan. All right, we will carry on to question number seven. The Canadian Environmental Protection Act is our overarching law to protect the health and environment of Canadians. The act has not been significantly amended since 1999, despite major changes in our understanding of toxic substances in our environment. A recent bill introduced in the last parliament did not make it past first reading. Will you support getting this bill reintroduced, strengthened, and made a top legislative priority? And Mike, we'll start with you. Absolutely, yes. Uh, Bill C-28 is a critical piece of legislation to move towards every person in Canada having the legal right to a healthy environment, uh, the right to be protected from the impacts of toxic substances and harmful pollution, and avoiding the adverse effects 
uh, from these toxic sub substances that disproportionately affect populations made vulnerable. And so specifically in the green platform, limiting the approval and use of toxic chemicals that affect our health and the environment, and also regulating microfibers as a toxic uh, substance. And so as the MP for Kitchener Center, would be keen to, it was a government bill. And so there was obviously a sense of interest uh, from the government at the, at the time, obviously not sufficient interest because well, 1999 was a while ago. And so, you know, pretty keen to, you know, as our MP to continue the push to uh, update the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And, uh, and in so doing, you know, push to, to not just move it past first reading, but, you know, actually get it, get it, uh, get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. B. Fan, over to you. Um, so I, you know, to keep the first part of the answer short, yes, I would support this or similar legislation if it were reintroduced in the House of Commons. Um, but I do find it incomplete. I think that the amendments that were also made were also incomplete. Um, right now, what we are doing is we are um, completely ignoring a wealth of uh, Indigenous knowledge and we are still uh, you know coming from a colonial framework um, for example when we ignore um, indigenous traditional information about uh, controlled burns uh, we saw what happened in British Columbia where before we even considered changing our approach to conservation cities had to be disappeared so clearly we haven't done that work and I just don't feel that the liberals who um, you know would rather put this Forward, then focus on making sure that residents are, um, you know, indigenous reserves have access to clean drinking water. Um, I don't trust that they will be a fair player in any of these conversations. But what I can tell you is that the NDP would be doing more. We actually. Um, first of all, are in favor of the Bill of Rights, but we are actually going to be pulling that into the environmental consequences, of, or sorry, the healthcare consequences of a poor environment, because we want to also build that infrastructure as well. So of course we have to relate those two. Of course we have to relate it to housing and how housing and climate change and homelessness and the unhoused and climate change are related and are impacting each other. So that's why the intersectional lens, I think is the most effective when we're talking about even things like an environmental bill of rights, we have to be coming from an intersectional and decolonized perspective to understand, you know, rights and how they affect different people in different situations. Thank you, B. Fan. Uh, Mike, you're the only one with a wild card left. Are you hanging on to it? All right. Hanging on. Okay. Here's the final question in the first section and the last opportunity for a wild card. One of our major local concerns is the extraction of aggregate, which affects our watershed. Amid a booming housing market, how will you ensure that new home construction is done sustainably and watersheds like ours are protected? And Bisan, it's your turn to start first. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of, of you know, my intro introduction, I'm an intersectional feminist and my lens is from an anti-oppressive, anti-racist framework. So one of the kind of cardinal rules of that is that no matter what your intentions are, um, no matter what the problem that you're trying to fix, do no harm. Because if you harm another group or another, you know, another being in your attempt to help another, I mean, those, you, you've, you've complicated it. That wasn't an act of solidarity. So, of course, when we are creating homes for people, we can't be creating harm for others. We need to be focused on the right way of doing things, building sustainable, building um, clean infrastructure, um, but recognizing that that is an opportunity for us. So, of course, aggregate Nothing should be polluting um, any any sort of body of water, but specifically the Grand River does not belong to us to pollute. It is um, it is the Haudenosaunee's, the Six Nations of the Grand Rivers, um, you know their treaty promised territory. So the answer should be no, but for a lot of reasons it should be no because that's criminal, um, but also it should be. No, because we have to un we have to figure out a way of doing the things that we need to do to solve climate without compounding systemic racism, without compounding colonialism. Because right now the framework um, is not there 
It is not there to make sure that within this act of business, within this movement of, of climate action, that we are not potentially causing um, harm to people who have been excluded and their voices have been left out. Uh, so that is to me, aggregate is just one way you can cause harm. There are a million ways you can cause harm if you're not thinking about the consequences of your actions and how different communities will actually feel them. Thank you, Bisan. Mike, over to you. So to the first part of the question around uh, new home construction, as I shared in 2019, we need to change the National Building Code to require new construction to meet net zero emissions standards. We need to do it as soon as possible at the very latest by 2030, while also recognizing we're going to need to do all the retrofits I was starting to speak about earlier. But this this question was talking about new home cons construction. So changing the building code, and that's at a national level, is a significant piece. Again, we should also be proud. Our community has been, our regional government has been protecting the countryside line, you know, taking the, the Ontario Municipal Board to court at one point to do so. And so strongly supportive of protecting the countryside line, of looking at infill and intensification, working towards 15 minute neighborhoods where all residents can meet their needs within a short walk or bike, whatever the case might be from their, from their homes. And that's where, again, the intersection between climate action and home construction and home affordability and ownership and transportation, if you're living in the city core in an affordable home and then maybe not needing a car and then also not needing the, the additional infrastructure is really critical if we're gonna make progress on climate while also providing affordable and livable options for folks uh, in terms of home ownership and renting. As it relates to the watershed, well, groundwater is essential in our community. Um, more than 800,000 people along the Grand River watershed rely on moraine aquifers and groundwater for clean drinking water. And so we need to protect it. And this is why, you know, Mike Schreiner, before he was elected in 2018 in, in Guelph, he was hearing the concerns around groundwater in Guelph. And so in his time in the legislature, could I use my wild card to just talk for an extra minute? Is that a thing? Yes, uh, Shannon, activate the one minute uh, wild card option. Thank you. Um, so when Mike got in, into, into office, one of his priorities was because he'd heard from so many of his neighbors around water being a real concern and priority. And so his first piece of private members legislation was the Paris Galt Moraine Conservation Act. And not only did it pass first and second reading, it passed second reading unanimously. And he did that by working respectfully, not looking to shame other people and parties, but actually working to find some common, common ground and get legislation passed by working with others. And that's exactly what I think uh, as our MP in Kitchener Center, learning from the experience and the legislative progress that folks like Mike as a singular green MPP in a majority government from another party have been able to do. That's the kind of thing I would also do. And I think we're all lucky for it in terms of protecting our watershed. Thank you. Okay, that ends the first part of our debate. Well done, candidates. And uh, it's a good time to just take a minute and stretch and have a deep breath, have a drink of water. Oh, I'm doing it. And now we have our rapid response question. Are you ready? Mike, be fan ready? Yes. Okay, excellent. Another party, not your own, proposes a climate policy and it comes up for a vote. You agree with the plan. Do you vote in support of it? Mike. Wholeheartedly, yes. Be fan. Uh have I done any more analysis? Have I spoken to stakeholders? Have I found out what, uh, you know, indigenous communities, like just because I agree with something doesn't make it automatically correct. I would do my due diligence as your member of parliament to make sure that there weren't things that I didn't know about that could potentially come up and harm us in the future. Thank you. Mary Jane, you're just muted. 
I was really on a roll. All right, <laughs> I'm back. We're now on to our four audience questions. Candidates, you have two minutes to respond, and there's no wild cards for this section. Just, I'll just remind our audience, this will be the first time our candidates have heard these questions. So number one, several submitted audience questions touched on concerns related to pipelines. What steps will you take to right the adverse effects of the Keystone pipeline and restore the ecosystems this project destroyed? How will this include reconciliation with indigenous people who are currently fighting to protect against the environmental destruction of their land? And Bisan, you are first up on this one. Yeah, so um, that question, again, isn't just a climate question. It's a question about our justice system. It's a question about what we are sending the RCMP to do and what that says about Canada. So I want to just kind of um, pull a couple things out of there first. So the first thing is pipelines. Um, I'm not in favor of pipelines. I don't think, again, um, you know, I, I, I personally do not see a future for uh, dirty oils, bitumen, any of that in the economy that is hopefully waiting for us. Um, I don't, they don't make sense to me uh, as a young person and as a person who is thinking about, um, you know, my future and my peers' future. Um, what I would do to make sure that we have reversed the negative effects is make sure that we have invested the right amount of uh, resources into cleanups, into um, uh, conservation, into re-conservation, re-preservation of the spaces where that, pi that TMX uh, a pipeline was meant to be, but then also make sure that the relationships and trust that we have been, um, you know, demolishing as a country are also repaired. Uh, when we move forward in a new economy, um, away from carbon, away from fossil fuels, we'll have the opportunity to do so in a way that is more respectful of our land, but also more cognizant of Canada as a, um, as a country that makes a lot of mistakes writing wrongs. And so hopefully that will be a part of reconciliation. But there is a long, long journey that awaits us if we want to get to um, a position of honor and respect with Indigenous communities. Uh, that's a two way street. Thank you, Mike, over to you, to you. And I can repeat the question if you would like. I can do that with each of you for these questions that you haven't heard before. Would you like that, Mike? Uh, sure. Sure. What steps will you take to right the adverse effects of the Keystone Pipeline and restore the ecosystems this project destroyed? How will this include reconciliation with Indigenous people who are currently fighting to protect against the environmental destruction of their land? So, so yeah, just in first, first of all, the facts of it, right? That it's by building these pipelines that we are on track to only have 0.5% of the world's population and yet export oil that would consume, I believe it's up to 16% of the world's carbon budget. So there's a, there's a justice and that's, that's in terms of, it's just unjust that we would continue with that. It's in unjust from a global point of view, but it's also disingenuous locally, whether we're talking about Keystone or the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion as a, you know, whether it's you know, cutting down old growth forest, the folks that are that are that are working in that field, we know that those jobs are going to be transitioning over time. And rather than putting the money into those pipelines, you need to be shifting those resources into the people that are working in those industries and standing alongside and in solidarity with Indigenous communities who have been pushing back, who continue to push back. Again, as you heard earlier, in terms of the RCMP and that. This is where we need advocacy alongside Indigenous communities to be amplifying those voices, to be then being in right relationship and shifting resources to, you know, we're never going to get those old growth forests back. However, we can re reallocate that funding into protecting natural uh, areas across, across the country that haven't already been sub subject to that and putting that funding into building the economy of the, of the future. Thank you. All right, question number two. How will you create green jobs that equip industry to reuse existing buildings and renew heritage infrastructure? And that was submitted by the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario. And we'll start with you, Mike. Yeah, this is it's a 
great question because it gets at the amount of work that needs to be done when we think about to recognize and, and obviously this organization, this person knows that retrofitting buildings is a far lower climate impact than building new. And so while we spoke about new home construction earlier, I'm glad we're talking about the, just the sheer amount of work. I think one of the more, more recent studies I saw estimated at potentially 4 million jobs across the country. If we were to be serious about retrofitting homes and businesses right across the country at the scale, right? It, we keep talking 50%. The science actually is 60% by 2030 is even closer to giving us a good chance of staying below 1.5 degrees C from a building point of view, separate from transportation. And of course, those are all you know, good paying jobs. Those are, those, are, those are trades jobs across the country and in our community. What, a great, what an advantageous position we're in, right? Already being known as a leader in the green economy locally, to be then as our MP advocating for the kind of green jobs that we need, retrofitting buildings right across the country. Uh, it, it, um, it's exactly where we need to be going. And that again, as our MP, that's exactly what I'd, what I'd be advocating for is for the investment in the retraining, in the worker supports, in the income protections, and in the incentives to make it that much easier for a homeowner or a business owner to say, of course, there's a clear payback on that investment and the federal government is there to push them to go further and faster. Thank you, Mike. Bisan, I'll say it one more time. How will you create green jobs that equip industry to reuse existing buildings and renew heritage infrastructure? Thank you. Um, green jobs are a huge focus of the NDP's platform. Uh, the Green New Deal goes well beyond just creating uh, uh, green jobs that, uh, you know, that do improve existing heritage or existing buildings, but they create jobs, um, you know, in, in a multitude of ways. But I am really happy to hear that the Green representative um, approves of retrofitting because the NDP has actually promised to retrofit every single building before the year uh, 2040, so within 20 years, um, and then built before the year 2020, and then every subsequent building after that in the 10 years after that. So we would be creating, you're right, millions of jobs. The NDP would be able to um, allow people to stay in their homes, to um, stay in their communities, allow communities to repurpose and um, creatively reimagine what spaces used to be into something new and, you know, something that's maybe more equitable, maybe for more people. It reminds me so much of the Tannery building located just down Charles Street, where I worked for a couple of years. Um, that used to be a building that was a slaughterhouse where cows were brought to have their, um, their, their leather and their hide kind of tanned. And then, you know, Q 150 years later, it is now um, a tech incubator. And that kind of repurposing um, created jobs, created so much innovation and so much interest in our region. But it was also just a really smart thing to do with a really centrally located large building. Um, those types of, you know, those types of synergies aren't exclusive to our region. But what we can do is share that example across Canada and say, here's how this worked in this time. Here's how it worked again. Um, you know, we can really be a leader and we can have a great platform to share all of these really exciting things that are happening in our region uh, with the support of a national united party like the NDP. Thanks, Bisan. Okay, question number three from the audience, and this was submitted by Anna Boer. She says, I strongly believe that intersectionality is of utmost importance when it comes to addressing climate change. Can you demonstrate how your own work and policies approach climate change or climate justice with an intersectional lens? And Bisan, you are up first. Thank you, uh, great question. Uh, yes, I am grounded in, in an intersectional framework. It is something that I have been working on for over a decade, but that is still in progress. What I will say is that 
the fundamental things that uh, you need to know about intersectionality are those kinds of primary rules of action first. So whatever you do has to be action oriented. You have to be trying to change things. Otherwise it's called performative or um, you know, just ineffective. Uh, the second rule is that it has to not create other harm. So that's where that, um, you know, my initial answer in terms of making sure that you know the consequences and the repercussions of your work. And then the third part of that is that you have to make sure that it has built solidarity and that it has been beyond you. Um, the, the point of an intersecting analysis is that you you are uh, beyond yourself um, taking in other experiences, but you also have to understand your own positionality and your own limitations. So I do uh, constant analysis when it comes to policy decisions, because that is so missing from the House of Commons. We are not getting people thinking about what are the implications of these policies. And I think to Indigenous leaders who teach us of the seven generations, that you have to think when you're making a decision collectively, what are the implications of, on, of, of this decision? seven generations down the line. And if you're causing harm to that seventh generation, you have to talk about that now. That, you know, even just understanding that that could be an option on the table for us to actually think about the long-term implications of that work is only one part of, of you know, my intersectional grounding. Um, you know, there's, I could go on. I actually do give trainings um, on this subject uh, quite often. Uh, but what I really just want to kind of, you know, uh, emphasize is that it's about understanding how systems work and working within them to effect change and actually change things. That's the point. Thank you, Bisan. Michael, I'll say it one more time. I strongly believe that intersectionality is of utmost importance when it comes to addressing climate change. Can you demonstrate how your own work and policies approach climate change or climate justice with an intersectional lens? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we have to recognize, of course, the intersections between the climate crisis and environmental issues that impact marginalized people across our community more. We were speaking earlier about environmental racism, for example, and recognizing that it's in lower income, it's in Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities where wastewater plants are often sit, uh, situated, and that we need to actually be ensuring there's a seat at the table for those people with lived experiences who have been made vulnerable by these policy decisions and that ensuring that the costs of action aren't borne by those who are hardest hit. I think that's a lot of what I've been a part of in our community over the last 10 years is ensuring that we, we actually have the climate plans in place, that we have a wide mix of people that are at the table and that those um, that those perspectives and lived experiences are heard. And we saw it most recently, you know, when, when the Transform WR plan got approved, you know, alongside, you know, groups like 50 by 30 that did uh, so much work to ensure that those voices were a part of that conversation and that, uh, that, th that those voices were actually heard in that conversation. I think the plan as a result was much more powerful and certainly recognizing my own identity as a, white, male, bald, you know, I don't have the, that lived experience. And so for me, as someone looking to be a voice for our community, what I have and will continue to do is to, is to listen to those who have that lived experience. It's why I've been knocking on doors for three years now, is to be in conversation, understanding, hearing from those with that lived experience and ensuring that that experience is centered in the kind of policies we've been talking about throughout this uh, evening. Thank you. All right, here comes our last audience question. And the last question before concluding remarks. What specific suggestions do you have in making Canada a world leader in the protection and restoration of our land, air, and water? And how will you tackle the corporate obstacles? This was submitted by Jackie Arojo. And Mike, we are starting with you. Yeah, it's a, a great question because it's the same question we have when it comes to fossil fuels too, right? That it's not only about what we can do as a country, but it's also, if we were to take that action as a country, how we could inspire 
and influence others. And so I find often when it comes to these conversations, some folks can dismiss us when we we're trying to get the climate plan approved in Kitchener, we were dismissed to say, oh, it's just Kitchener. It's not big enough to have a real influence or it's just Canada, you know, our protected lands or our climate impact is not big enough to have an, Im an impact and make a difference. But I think what Jackie's calling out in this question really well is that if we were to take that leadership role, if we were, as, as we were talking about earlier, to meaningfully move from the 11% to that minimum 30% of protected uh, land and fresh water and oceans. And if we can do that, if we can make that kind of jump, that's then a case study and an example for others to follow suit on. And so I think what I can do as the MP for Kitchener Center would be to work alongside others in the House of Commons to move past the promises and actually move towards um, to, towards getting closer to that 30%, recognizing that the positive impact of that when it comes to bio, bio, uh, biodiversity, when we're in the midst of a sixth extinction event, that we need to be in a place where this is actually, yes, about the impact that can have in our community, across the country, but also how we could influence and uh, have an impact on others around, around the world too. And in terms of the corporate obstacles, this is again where we need to be recognizing that there are various in interests at play that are looking to hold the status quo. And that as RMP, I'd be looking to be putting the focus first and foremost on the voices of our neighbors, as opposed to various corporate interests to be ensuring that those voices are heard. And it's those voices that have been calling out for far more action on climate, far more environmental leadership. And that's exactly what I would be, would be bringing to uh, Ottawa. Thank you, Mike. Now, Bissan, let me read it one more time. What specific suggestions do you have in making Canada a world leader in the protection and restoration of our land, air, and water? How will you tackle the corporate obstacles? I'm muted. Um, I won't lie, corporate obstacles is a bit of a euphemism for predatory capitalism, if we're being honest. If we are talking about a system that is built to exploit people, to exploit workers, to exploit the planet, to exploit animals, if we continue to absolve that, that action, that, that actual source of climate change, that source of pollution, that source of emissions, that source of uncleaned up oil spills, that it's always profit over everything. If we don't address that pernicious issue, um, I don't know how we can be a leader on anything. I feel like we are at a moment where we are talking about solidarity, but we're talking about it in, in very abstract terms. Solidarity is action. It's not talking. It's not waiting. It is looking across the board and looking at the work that is happening and joining and joining that movement. Um, unfortunately, we can't lead on a global level until we have come to terms with our own identity as a country, with our own issues with colonialism, with our issues with imperialism and our foreign policy. We, we have a lot of work to do. And so that climate growth has to be in tandem with so many other conversations that I just don't hear coming from other people. And that is really how we become a global leader. We become intersectional climate leaders. Canada leads by example, instead of saying we want to do something when it comes to domestic policies, and then completely doing something different when it comes to our treatment of Indigenous peoples, and doing the same thing globally and abroad, acting as though we are, you know, peacekeepers and the global leaders, when our reputation has tanked, because Canadian companies are committing, um, you know, terrible acts in, in, in Southern um, American countries, and we know that we are not acting on the global stage as a leader, so we need a reality check before we think that conversation can change all of that stuff. All right. Thank you both. Big breath. It's now time for concluding remarks. You each have two minutes and Bisan, it is your turn to go first. I worked on Parliament Hill 
when I was 25, 26, 27, I have already spoken about the culture of sexual harassment that I endured and that it is extremely important for me to go back and fix. But I think that also just gives me an understanding of the reality of the place. You can't go in as one person and change everything. Elizabeth May had the same idea when she was first elected. That strategy changed. If you want to consult with your fellow you know, green members on how far they got on, you know, uh, you know, respectful negotiation with the sources of, you know, climate change, um, you can ask. She's, you know, she, she might still be there. But what we need to look at now is where do we go from here? This moment is an opportunity and you have to look at the tools in front of us, not the tools we wish we had. Our system is operating in a way that Westminster system means that we will probably have a minority government. There will be no elected representation. If you want those things to happen, there, there is only one candidate from one party that is actually pushing those things that has a chance of making those things happen. I am so, I, it's nothing personal. It is completely my understanding of system dynamics, how the system works, and how it responds to change. If we're going to just lose this opportunity when do we start when do we start joining solidarity movements when do we start stop like stop talking the talk and start walking the walk we have a chance to actually say this is the time for us to look across the board police siren to see what we can do in solidarity with people across the country in tandem by building these movements, building them with indigenous leaders, not just talking to them and then saying what they said when you get to seat at the table, but making room at the table. That is how we move forward as a country. That is how we are intersectional. That is how we decolonize. And that is what we need to do. Thank you, Bisan. Thank you. And now, Mike, your two minutes concluding remarks. Yeah, well, first of all, to start in my conclusion would be to recognize that Elizabeth May is still an MP, has long been an advocate. In fact, just a few months ago was advocating for amendments to the Net Zero Climate Change Accountability Act. This is C12 and had put forward a number of amendments to improve that act, 19 of which were voted down in part by members of the NDP. And so I think it's important to be, that is important to be working towards across party lines to make progress on the things that we all care about most. And that's my commitment to our neighbors across the city, across Kitchener, Kitchener Center, is having spent three years listening to folks across our, our community, uh, to be listening well, to be working respectfully across party lines and to be putting in the work. It was three pairs of shoes last time, going to every single door in the riding with hundreds and hundreds of people. And from that, having heard the common ground of which there is so much, we've of course tonight was on the environment specifically, but it's also of course about the affordability of housing and it's about truly universal healthcare and yes, the climate crisis as well. And so those are the things that as the MP for Kitchener Center, that we're in a position to now bring that kind of community voice to Ottawa first and, for, and foremost. And as that voice to be advocating for everyone across Kitchener Center, regardless of how someone chooses to vote. Uh, my, ask, my aspiration and interest would be to be a voice for all of us. And so if anyone would like to chat more, again, this wasn't the right for, uh, uh, format for that. If someone would like to have a follow-up conversation, I'd welcome that. They can go to my website. It's mikemorris.ca. They'll find a full list of priorities there. And if they'd like to have a follow-up conversation, there's a green button in the bottom right. They can schedule a call. Would be glad to give that person a call back at a time that works well for, for them. Thanks again to Water of the Region Nature and Sustainable Water of the Region and Reap Green Solutions. I'm sure I'm missing there's other folks that were a part of this that uh, pulled this together in such a short amount of time. And to everyone that joined us tonight uh, live and, and also watching the recording afterwards as well. Uh, thanks for being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. Residents of Kitchener Center, this concludes our debate tonight. Since we are not all together in a room to show our applause, I'm gonna do it on behalf of all of us. Thank you very much, Bethan and Mike, for stepping forward to serve our community and for participating in tonight's debate. And I know it was your second one today, that's pretty intense. So bravo to both of you. 
This event and the other debates taking place tonight in Waterloo Region were jointly hosted by the Rare Charitable Research Reserve, Waterloo Region Nature, Reap Green Solutions, Grand River Environmental Network, Nith Valley Eco Boosters, Sustainable Waterloo Region, and Green Pack. And we want to say thank you to all of those organizations for working together to put these debates on. I want to say a special thank you tonight to superlative organizer Jenna Quinn, Vice President at Waterloo Region Nature and a biologist at RARE. She's the mastermind. And a big thanks also to fearless timer Shannon Pennington, Out Outings Director at Waterloo Region Nature also. And thank you to all of you, audience members, for demonstrating support for the environment as an important issue in this federal election. We had over 100 people attending tonight, and that's a testament to how important this issue is in Kitchener Centre. So have a great evening, evening, everyone, and remember to vote so your voice can be heard. Good night, all.